We're going to open up our service with a chorus, song number 58. We've sung it the past couple weeks. I just keep trusting my Lord as I walk along. I know. I just keep trusting my Lord as I walk along. I just keep trusting my Lord and he gives a song. Though the storm clouds darken the sky or the heavenly veil, I just keep trusting my Lord, he will never fail. He's a faithful friend, such a faithful friend, I can count on him. darken the sky or the heavenly trail I just keep trusting my Lord he will never fail great singing this morning Tim says pastor please <laughs> well, let's open up with a word of prayer father thank you for christ thank you for the gift that we have in your son the lord jesus christ how we can grow and that we can uh, please you in all that we do father thank you once again for your goodness and your grace we pray this in christ's name amen all righty um if we look up here, uh, I know Randy's here somewhere, but um, I don't see him right now. Okay, so up here is our verse, and we have one more week, and then after that week, we'll move to our new verses, and the goal is to go to the gym and sweat a little bit, and uh, <laughs> to excite you there to go work out, and so we want to work out spiritually too, and one way is memorizing God's word, so we'll say it together, we'll say the, the, the reference, the verse, the reference. Here we go together. Colossians 1.10, that ye may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Colossians 1.10. Then our second verse, the goal is to try to memorize all of them, which would be 24, but if not, memorize one of the two if you can. Together, Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, 105. Man, I tell you, my memory span went from the screen to here, gone. Does anybody else have that problem? You can't even remember if you have that problem. <laughs> Well, we're glad you're here today. It's exciting to, to have you here. And uh, Tim is going to come now. And is it overly hot in here? Yeah. Okay. I'll, no? Yes? No. Okay. I'll turn it down a little bit then so we can find a medium there. Thank you. Well, let's stand together this morning. We're going to begin singing with our service. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. We're given an awesome opportunity to serve our Lord. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. Where do calls or danger be 
never wanting there. On the last, stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. This day, the noise of battle, the next, the victor song. To him that overcometh, a crown of life shall be. just to sing and worship to the Lord truths about God, truths about Christianity, the Bible. I just love singing songs like this, which are based from Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God. Um, it's just such an encouragement that we get to come to church and worship God together. And it's great to see the whole church together this morning. Amen? Uh, it's just been great. Well, we're going to continue singing this morning, song 661, Little as Much When God is in It. Maybe you think of the story of when Jesus fed the 5,000 and how he took that small boy's lunch and fed over 5,000 people plus women and children, right? And we're going to be talking about that in our junior church today, which is kind of cool. But um, when God gets in it, it's not little anymore. It's much. God can do a lot with our lives and with us. Let's sing it out this morning, Little is Much When God is in It. In the harvest field now ripen, there's a work for all to do. Hark, the voice of God is calling to the harvest calling you. a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus name does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known it is great if God is in it and he'll not forget his own little is much when God is in it labor not for wealth or fame there's a crown and you can if you'll go in Jesus' name on the last. When the conflict here is ended and our race on earth is run, he will say, if we are faithful, welcome home, my child, well done. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it. If you'll go in Jesus' name. Great singing this morning. You may be seated. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, we want to keep our eye on the ball. Our theme this year is growing in grace. And that means that you have to go to the gym every day, the spiritual gym. So I want to keep exhorting you to keep on. It's easy to start. Uh, they say that... Uh, uh, New, Year res New, New Year's resolutions last about a month or two, and the gyms are very happy because you pay and it costs you a fortune to get out of it. And it's the same thing here, too. We can get off to a good start, but we can, we can kind of just fall apart, and we don't want to do that. Remember, the spiritual discipline book is for you at home. It's not to be brought to church in the sense of we're studying it. I sent out the first two weeks of lessons, and there are some study questions that will help you as you read the first chapter, do the questions that come along with it. When you read the second chapter, do that. You have, plan it out, you have the whole year to get it finished. On March 7th, that's the first Sunday of March, right after church, we'll have about a 20 minute little get together. If you're reading this book and you'd like to, just to kind of give me your opinion on it, uh, maybe something you've learned. And so it'll be an open dialogue. It's not going to be me teaching. I'm just going to say, does anybody want to share anything that they've learned out of the book or, you know, your opinion on the book? And we'll do that every so often to kind of keep in touch with it. Don't forget also that the memory verses, stay on it. Uh, you'll be glad. God will use those in ways that cannot be explained, how he'll take his word that's down in your heart, and he will use it in many opportunities to be a blessing to others to help you when you are overwhelmed to share with others 
how the Holy Spirit will bring that back to your memory for you to be able to get it out and use it effectively. It is only the Word of God that changes us, nothing else. And so we must be that. Uh, one person said this, I thought it was excellent. If the mountain was smooth, no one could climb it. Now just think about that for a minute. If the mountain was smooth, nobody could climb it. And that's the way it is in progressive sanctification. There's a lot of twists and turns, and God says that there's up and down and all around, but there's a purpose to it, and that's to get to the mountaintop. Let's get there. Let's not live at the bottom of the mountain. We don't have to. You can grow in your Christ-likeness. Why have you not grown? Why are you not growing? Let's grow this year. Let's, let's, let's get all we can while we're still here. Christ could come today. We know that. He could come tomorrow. He could come next year. We don't know, but let's do all that we're to be doing here. Let's not be more excited about our disappearing. Let's be more excited about his appearing. So do all you can until you hear the trumpet. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. One more thing. Okay, now you're going to have to be really loud. Uh, yesterday was Miss Karen's birthday, and I know that they cannot hear unless it's really loud. So on the count of three, let's just say happy birthday. One, two, three. Happy birthday, Karen! All right. Amen. Well, uh, with that being said, let's stand together. Oh, before we do, I apologize. Um, I have one announcement, which is that on Friday, we were able to have a youth activity with our teenagers, and um, it was a really great time. We had six teenagers there, a couple of the kids from our uh, community, as well as our, our church teens that have been faithful coming. Uh, I, I don't know if they really missed any. Uh, they, it's been great. And we were able to uh, move all the chairs, have some games all over the building. It was, it was a lot of fun. And I'm thankful so much for their attitudes, for the, for the parents allowing them to come, and for the fact that we are reaching some of the kids in our community. So praise the Lord for that and for how he's allowed us to, to how he's used those. Well, let's um, stand together this morning. We're going to sing our third hymn, Jesus Paid It All. We give our lives to him because of what he did for us. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. all Thy power and thine alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain. Singing, you may be seated. All righty. Well, we have our teenagers staying in here today. And let me just remind the teenagers uh, you are the future. We're so glad to be able to have you up here occasionally. Um, you know, there wasn't always a junior church, there was a time when families just all met together. They never separated out into children's church or nursery or whatever. They're able to, and you're at the age right here that is if you will concentrate and try to put effort into listening to the message, you will understand it. 
you have the same Holy Spirit that we do, and God is able to use it in your life in the same way that he uh, uses it, of course, um, uh, in, in, in each one of our lives. So if you would, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Numbers, Numbers, chapter number 13. Now, just like we have learned that, let me turn this mic off, that we've learned that in uh, Corinthians, we know that that's a book of correction, so we know that every book has a theme. And when you think of the book of Numbers, you want to have something really short that helps you to remember what that book's about. And so when you get there, it's not the totality of the book, there's too much in there, but it just kind of gives you an, an overview of it. So when you think of the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, uh, think of um, order. God is a God of order. You'll find in the book of Numbers that God lays out great order, and he is a God of order, and we ought to be people of order as well. And one time a, a guy stood up and he said, uh, when he was going to preach, he said, uh, I'm going to preach through the whole book of Numbers. And all of us said, oh no. This does not sound good. And uh, he said, it's a book of orders. Thank you, our invitation now. And that's really basically, when you get there, just think that it's a book of order. A book of order, and God is order. Now we're going to read our text, starting in verse number 26. Now, this is a narrative, and so you're, we're not going to be able to cover every verse in the narrative in the message. So as we read the narrative, try to pick up on what's happening. Try to grasp what's going on because we can't keep coming back and, 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 and also get the message out at the same time. What is taking place here is God had always promised that he was going to bring them to the promised land that was given to, in Genesis chapter number 12, to Abraham, that God would multiply his seed. It would be more than the stars in the sky, which are quite a few, and more than the sands on the seashore. Now, through a series of events, we know that um, Israel went into captivity, and God led them out of captivity. They crossed the Red Sea, and God was going to bring them to a land that was flowing with milk and honey. But as he, as, as he brought them out of Egypt, he said two things. One is he says, I'm going to prove you. So in other words, they needed to grow in their dependence on him. And he wanted to see if they would follow him. And the second was is that the wickedness of the nations had not reached the fullness of the cup yet. God was still long-suffering to them, and he was hoping for them to repent. Of course, he knows all things that they want, but he is a long-suffering God. And so we are going to watch Israel come to the very spot where God says, okay, there it is, it's yours. And we're going to pick up from there, uh, that, that, that getting to that point and how they responded to that. Now think about this. Every decision that you make uh, begins to set the stage for your future. The decisions that Ava is making at this age is actually setting her future. Same thing with Richard and Gavin and Amanda that's in the nursery. Those are important. Every decision a lot of them that you made at children set maybe where your career was. You were just determined to go to college. You made that decision, and look, at it bore out fruit. So the same thing, so the decisions you make today, no matter what age you are, are really setting your future a walk with Christ as well. So let's take a look at our text together. We're starting in verse number 26. And they went and came to Moses and Aaron, and to all the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh, and brought back word unto them, and unto all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. So they went across, 12 spies, 10, uh, 11, uh, I'm sorry, did I say 11? 13, I'm sorry, I, might, I thought it was maybe 13, 26. Uh, so they sent over 12 spies, there's a song, you probably sing it, uh, Eve, with the children, uh, Ten said bad, two said good, and, and it's, a, it's a catchy little song. So 12 went over to spy, one from each of the tribes. There's 12 tribes, one went over each. The, so they come back with the report. 
And they told them and said, We came unto the land, whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. They brought some back with them. The fruit was good. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children's, children of Anak there, and the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report um, of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land uh, uh, through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature, and there, and there we saw the giants and the son of Anak, which came, to, uh, came of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. So you see the report? That could be a little exaggerated. But there, 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 there's fear going on here. And it's spreading through the camp. The 12 spies come back, and 10 of them are saying, oh my goodness, we can't do it. Two are saying, it's our land. Verse 14. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation and said to them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt. Now you know what they went through in Egypt. And they're saying, hey, we, would just, we should have just died there. This is ridiculous. Or would God we had died in the wilderness. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us up unto this, this land, or blaming God, to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey, were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? Now they've said that many times, but you'll notice the difference here. And they said one to another, let us make captains and let us return unto Egypt. into Egypt. This is the first time that they actually started organizing people together saying, okay, Here's how we're going to get back. Here's how we're going to get back. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their face before the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel, and Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Honey, Only rebel not uh, ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. Now listen to this, for they are bread for us. In other words, we're going to eat them up. We, we're we're going to destroy them. We got God. We got the creator of all things. They're going to be like nothing. They're like the bread you throw out to the ducks for them to eat it up. It's, they're, they're nothing. Their defense is departed. God took away all their ability to, to be warriors. Is departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stones them with stones. In other words, they got together and said, you know what? Let's stone Caleb and Joshua. Because we're not going. These guys are saying going. If we go, our children, our wives will kill all us and they'll take our women, they'll take our children. They'll, no, we're, we're going to stone them and we're going to go back to Egypt. Is what they're saying here, that they're, they're literally going to stone these two men. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? How long will it be ere that they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? Which that's how the reason we're reading this is that God has told them since day one, the land is theirs. The land is theirs. It, it's going to be your land. I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make, up, make of thee a greater nation and mightier than them. Uh, we're we're going to end there. And, um, and we'll talk about what Moses or what uh, God is, means when he, when he says that. Let's open up here in a word of prayer. Father, thank you now as we all 
realize that your promises are yea and yea. And there's not one of them that has ever failed to be fulfilled. There is not one promise that we can look at in the scriptures and go back and say, God, you just didn't fulfill it. Thank you that we can trust your word and that we can trust you. Help us not to live in, 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 in disbelief. Help us not to live in unbelief, but help us to believe uh, by faith that you are who you say you are. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So Kadesh Barnea is a place of decision. You've been there before. How many of you have ever had to make a decision? Some of you, are your biggest decision is, am I going to get out of bed when the alarm goes off? That's probably maybe one of the biggest things you're facing. But Kadesh Barnea is known as a place of decision in the life of the nation and the people of Israel. The Israelites failed the test that took place at Kadesh Barnea. And that decision remained etched in their memory forever. They made the wrong decision. Even today, if you go and talk to a Jewish person and ask them about Kadesh and that decision not to go in the promised land, they know it. It is, it, is, it is a terrible decision that they made. Their unbelief led to the postponement of entering Canaan and claiming God's blessings. Um, may we not follow the unbelief of those that did not trust God to fulfill his promises. When time of testing comes, may we display the faith that Joshua and Caleb had in trusting God at Kadesh Barnea. Today, you'll be placed into a spiritual Kadesh. Today. The proposition of today's message is simply this. Will you follow God wholeheartedly? You're going to be right there at the same place that the Israelites were as they stood ready to go into the promised land and they chose not to go. You stand there spiritually. Will you follow God wholeheartedly or will you wander and waste your life as the Israelites did by their refusal to trust the promises of God? So we stand today, you and I together, we stand right here as we listen to God's word and will we follow God wholeheartedly on the promises of God even in the day and the age that we live in? Now we're not going to the promised land. So we're not like them in that regards. But a lot of the truth and the principles we find that Caleb had to make the decision to go can be played out in our life as well. So uh, let's, let's jump into our text here in just a moment. Um, so how you spend the rest of your life will be determined on the decision you make today. We will find that to be true in our narrative today, so the message is relevant. Whether you're the youngest or you're the oldest in here today, I want to say to each of us here today, do not waste your life. Don't waste your life. It's so short. Will you follow God wholeheartedly? That is the message this morning. Just imagine if each one of us decide to follow God wholeheartedly, what impact would that have in your homes? What impact would that have um, in, in your workplace? What impact would that have in our community? What impact would that have throughout the whole world? To follow God wholeheartedly is a demanding life. It's a disciplined life. It is a determining life, and it is a delightful life of joy and peace. Today, let's consider these three points. The major and minority report. The majority, I should say, and the minority report. The second um, is the message and the mission report. The message and mission report. And the third is the measure and massiveness report. The measure and the massiveness report. Our first point is the majority and the minority report. Let's look at our text, starting in verse 30 of chapter 13. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses. So could you imagine it? All these people, and he's trying to get their attention. Just, here, listen to me, hear me. And says, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. But the men... They went up with him and said, We be not able to go up against these people. They are stronger than we are. 
And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. They're so powerful, they just consume everyone that comes into the land. And all the people that we saw there are men of great stature. And there, were, and there we saw giants, the son of Anak, which came, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. That's quite a comparison. And so were we in their sight. They all saw the same thing, but gave different reports. It's 12 people. They all say the same thing, but yet the report is different. Caleb and Joshua saw the same things, and yet... The, um, and yet the ten said it can't be done, and the two said it can. They said the children of Anak are giants. We're like grasshoppers. We're like nothing. They could just crush us in comparison. There's no future for us. Uh, we've been sold a bill of goods. Yeah, God opened the Red Sea. Yes, God guides us by a pillar of cloud during the day and, and the light at night. I know that he does all that. And, 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 he, got, and he got us out of Egypt, but he falls short of this. That's what they were saying. We, we have been doomed to the wilderness. The, my, the minority, two are uh, the minority, the, the, the two rather, they're a minority, they're ignorant. And the millions of Jews followed the majority report. That's typical of the spiritual response to the word of God today. It seems like most of us follow the majority that God's dead. Well, we don't really believe that, but we act like it. We don't follow his promises. We don't put him first. And so we follow the majority, what the masses say. But the problem was the majority report was full of fear and unbelief. And if you're going to follow the majority, it is full of fear and unbelief. The majority and the minority report agreed on the facts. But the majority report left out two major facts. God and the promises of God. God said it. God said, I will, and everything he said that he will, he does. But they couldn't see that. Do you see what happens sometimes? We let our fear be greater than the promises of God. And that's what happened there. And so when the people said, they're giants, they're going to take our people, they're going to take your kids, and the men are going to be killed, they all began to get in fear. But Caleb and Joshua said, wait a minute, what about the promises of God? He says the land is ours. Because of that, the giants became bigger and God became smaller. When you consult with flesh and blood and with disbelief, you do not consult with God and the promises of God which way you will go. You know, God does not show us everything. He just tells us to walk by faith. He says, wherever you go, I've been there. You can trust me if you'll just follow the word of God, even though it seems like I should make an ark because there's going to be water. Even though that sounds ridiculous, just follow me because my promises always come true. See, your fear will diminish your faith. There's no future but a barren wasteland. That's all they could see. Caleb and Joshua were the minority report because they based their decision on God's promises. God said it. Young person, God says it. Live pure, live holy, obey your parents. It, it's the wisest thing for you. Trust him. Make that decision now. I'm going to follow God. Those of us that are older, I'm just going to trust God. If God says it, I am going to lead my family that way because God is always right. And I can trust him. I can trust him no matter what I am facing. See, if you, follow the whole, if you follow wholeheartedly your heart wholeheartedly, the promises of God, you'll have a life that's full and full of grace, a life of victory, a life that accomplishes God's will. But the opposite is, is that if you live in fear, that you'll be stymied. Your, your life will come to a halt because of unbelief. And you'll, you'll waste time and you'll kill time. And you have a life that seeks its own pleasure, that seeks nothing bigger than yourself. That's what they did. They lived a selfish life. They decided instead of what God had for them, they couldn't see it, so they didn't go. 
And because they didn't go for 40 years, everybody of the age of 20 and older, or older than 20, wandered in the desert land until their carcasses fell dead. What a wasted life. And God said, if you'll just cross, I have so much fullness and so much joy to give you. But they said, no, nope, we're not going to do it. And they lived in unbelief. God provided for them, but they wandered. Could you imagine being stuck on State Street for the rest of your life? You can have the restaurant, because you have to eat, and you can have the dentist and the one clothing shop. That's it. That was their life. For 40 years, they wandered like that. What a waste. Because they would not believe that God's ways are better. What a way to spend your life. What a waste. Don't waste your life. Follow God fully. If you live in unbelief, you will find it to be a very small world. Caleb believed in the God of the universe and the giants became small. And he was saying, what are you talking about? The giants are like grasshoppers. Because my God is big. My God is powerful. My God is able to do the impossible. My God spoke and the worlds were created. My God spoke and those people were created. My God. Ecclesiastes 8.10, the wisest man in the world, said this, Solomon. And so I saw the wicked buried, who had come and gone from the place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This also is vanity. Well, what does that mean? Well, what it's talking about here is that back in that day, Solomon was speaking of the Jewish people. They would go to temple every Saturday. They would go there, but they left unchanged. It just was a habit. Hey, we go to temple. Hey, we go to church. And let you leave the pews, and there's no change. You go back to the same exact life you were living before you arrived here. The Word of God has no effect, no stirring, no changing, because you are in unbelief. And that's what he was saying here. It was the same back then as it is today. And so he, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, he, uh, Solomon is saying that. He says, you leave. And they were good Jews. They were good Jews. They were good people. They worked hard. They, they worked. They built businesses. Uh, they, they socialized. But spiritually, there was no change in their life. When they left, they were unchanged. Con they continued to marry, they had jobs, they were religious, they bore children, they died, and their children did the same thing as they did. Nothing. Nothing at all. Success was measured by how much money you had, how big your home was, not on following God wholeheartedly. That's what God wants. He wants you, as Caleb, to follow him wholeheartedly. They did not live for the purpose they were created. Did you know that's what you're created for? There is nothing else that can satisfy except to fully give your life to God. They did not live like Caleb, who lived his life out of the promises of God. Hey, God said it, let's go. What do you mean we're not going to go? Uh, are you crazy? There it is. God said, the, we don't even have to build the buildings. They're all there for us. Let's go take the land. God opened the Red Sea. I mean, look what he did. He, he destroyed all the Egyptians. Why are we not going? They must have really had a struggle with that. And then to see that they were going to pick up stones and stone them. These were their own people. It'd be like the church, except for two people. When we say, let's go reach our community, that you would get up and stone two people that said, we can. You said, we can't. They won't listen to us. They, 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 they won't. Maybe they, 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 it, it's impossible. God says it is. God says it is possible, and he is doing it. So they didn't live like Caleb did. They were busy, but busy with the wrong things. When you follow God wholeheartedly, your testimony remains now and beyond the grave. People see you as an example now, 
and after you're with the Lord. Take a look at Hebrews 11.4. In Hebrews 11.4, if you want to turn there, Hebrews 11.4, we see that example. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 4, it says, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. God told Abel and Cain what to bring. Cain decided to bring what was left over, and Abel brought the best. God wants your best today. If you're not here with your best, what are you doing here? You're just like Cain. You're bringing what's left over. You're to bring your best. And, and so Abel brought his best, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, because he did right. And God testified of his gifts, and by it, he being dead yet speaketh. Cain killed him, rose up and took a stone and killed his brother because he was so jealous. But God says his blood is still speaking today because he did right. Do not waste your life. Which one of you people go home today and say, hey, I need you to follow Cain. Give your second best. Man, go and live, child. Live. Go to church on Sunday. Give a tip in the offering plate. But go and do what you want to do. No, we don't use Cain as an example. We use Abel. We say, give your whole heart to God. Be like Caleb. Be in the minority. Hey, dare to be different. You stand at a spiritual Kadesh Barnea. Right now, make the right choice. Go God's way. Go God's way by grace. Make the decision if you're going to live for the one true God, the one true Savior, the one true Holy Spirit, the triune God. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's what Paul said. He said, I'm all out. I'm all in. God first. That's the point. Caleb, he lived... For God wholeheartedly. Church, follow God wholeheartedly. Give your best to Him. Our second point is the message and the measure report. Let's look at our text. We're going to look at Numbers 14, verse number 24. Numbers 14, verse number 24. But my servant Caleb... Because he had another spirit with him and had followed me fully. Get the language there? This is, this is the Lord speaking. That Caleb followed him fully. Him will I bring into the land wherein too he went and his seed shall possess it. The heart of our text is this. Is that you need to be born again so you can have another spirit. You, if you're unsaved in here, then this is all a bunch of gibberish. It makes no sense. Go out and make my fortune. Go out and stake your claim. Go out and be famous. Go out and have a name. Go out and build a company. That's what the world screams to you. But if you're here and you're born again, then you have another spirit. And because we're in the New Testament, you have the Holy Spirit of God that lives within you, that guides you in all truth. And you can follow God fully. If you're not following God fully, it is because it's a spirit of unbelief. An unbelief. The foundation of the text is Caleb had another spirit guiding him. Caleb had another spirit, not only a bold and generous and a courageous and a noble and a heroic spirit, but the spirit, capital S, an influence of God. He just believed God's word. God said the land's yours. No more, no less. And he said, well, God says it's ours. Why would it not be? Really? What are you you're saying that God made a mistake? And which enables him to rise above human inquietudes. And what inquietudes mean is concerns or earthly fears. He didn't look at the giants. He didn't see giants. He, Caleb never comes back and says, I saw giants. He just doesn't come back and say that. You know what he says? I see honey and fruit, just like you said, Lord. They came back. They didn't talk about the food. They talked about the giants. Isn't that the way we are sometimes? I can't obey my parents. I can't do it. I can't live for God. It can't be done. Once you're saved, you're able to march to a different voice. 
you, you, you desire to follow God. Once you have the Holy Spirit, we should follow God wholeheartedly. How? By following God consistently. The statement is an idiom, fits and starts. You ever hear that before? Fits and starts. It means stops and starts. We shouldn't have that as born-again believers. We should be consistent. Believers can live periods of their life with zealousness for the Lord and then at other times be very sporadic. It's kind of like this, up and down. It seems that anything comes their way to upset their faith causes them to be characterized uh, their life as a roller coaster. In other words, okay, everything's fine. Guess what? The paycheck arrived. Uh, my boss is happy with me. Uh, the weather's good. And everything seems to be going good. Man, this faith is great. And then as soon as anything at all seems to come into our life, we have a meltdown. And we just go down into the dumps and we say, oh, God. Did you ever think that God is using that to make you even more trusting to Him or that maybe your neighbors would see something that they need to see? And so God does not take believers through roller coasters. It's always an upward climb. But sometimes we just quit. And that's what happened to the Jews here. Boy, were they happy when the, when the Red Sea opened. I mean, God was number one. They were all wearing their God is number one shirt. And then as soon as things got a little desperate... Those shirts went inside out. Let's return to Egypt. They had both. When they were moving forward, it said, God is great. And every time they didn't like it, it said, back to Egypt. And that's the way we are too sometimes. And we ought to be consistent, walking by faith. They find it easy to live for God when things are going well. But anything that causes concerns, they see giants. Hey, what giants do you have? What giants are you seeing today? I bet they're pretty big. And you know what? I bet they're real. I don't think you're imagining them. There are some real giants out there. But to make them grasshoppers, you're going to have to trust God. Because God is in control. And God is able to. See, they saw giants. Caleb didn't. Caleb followed God fully. He refused to yield to the murmuring rebels who said it could not be done. I feel for our teenagers. They have a real battle ahead of them. They have intense peer pressure at school. They have intense peer pressure with their friends. And they are going to be much different if they do what God says. The thought and concept of purity is unknown in our schools. But yeah, you're called to be that. Same thing with us. The peer pressure you must face at work. The peer pressure you must face in your community. The peer pressure you must face. But yet, with your family. I know that was for Nancy and I when we got saved. Man, those were tough conversations. I'm just going to tell you that right now. There was times we didn't say anything because it was just too fearful. But God's called us to trust Him. Those are real giants. Caleb followed God even though it meant that all of his peers rejected him. Millions against two. If you don't waste your life, this must be your resolve. Follow God wholeheartedly, no matter what other people think. Second, to follow God sincerely. Follow him with your, all your heart. It means willing to give back your life to him who sacrificed all for you. It means to be willing to follow him because he knows what's best for you. Caleb showed this example in Numbers chapter 14, verse 9. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. So don't do this. This is wrong. God knows what's best. God knows what's best for you. I know you have giants. I know you're facing very difficult times in the house, out of the home. I know that. But stay the chorus. God said that his promises are all yea and yea. Stay with him. That's the winning side. That's the victorious side. God promised victory. He commanded them to go. He didn't give it an option. God does not give us an option to follow him. He says, I saved you. Follow me. This is how we must be. Hey, God has given us our community. Let's rise up and take it. Guess what? He has told us. He has said, Faithway Baptist Church, 
I have planted you here in this community. Go take it. It's there. I've already given it to you. It isn't that I might give it to you. He says, it is yours. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? Are we, are, are we afraid of the giants? They're grasshoppers. Let's go take our community. Let's go reach our friends. Let's go reach our neighbors. Let's go re reach our, our workmates. Let's, let's put a priority on reaching what God has already given us. He's given us victory all the way to the end. We just need to take it. We need to believe it by faith. We need to believe it by faith. Just like Caleb. Be a Caleb. We ought to get shirts. Be a Caleb. Someone will come here and go get them and sell them for 20 bucks a piece. I'll buy two. <laughs> Caleb said, we've got the promises of God on our side. This is a sure thing. They are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. So you want to know if you're living in fear? If you're not living for God, you're living in fear. The people said, nope, they're giants. And look at what the people did. In Numbers 14.10, once again, they wanted to stone them. Wanted to stone them. Caleb's response is not to negotiate. Okay, well, listen. I don't want to be stoned. Let's do this. Uh, we'll go in and we'll just take 20 miles of the land. And then we can all live right here in both places. We could actually live in the world and live in spiritual victory. Wouldn't that be great? We could live in the world and in spiritual victory. And Caleb says, what are you talking about? It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. There is no halfway. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. All his ways. He promises the victory. Caleb follows the Lord even in the face of being stoned. Now, I've never been stoned. Has anybody experienced that before? What they do is they pick up rocks that are fairly good size, and they put you against something so you can't run, and then they make a circle, a half circle around you because they don't want a rock to accidentally hit them. And then they put you against that wall, and then they keep throwing stones at you until you die. That's what they do. That's what they were doing. Caleb says, listen, if you stone me, you stone me. I am not changing my mind. That's the way Caleb was. He'd rather die than disobey. Young person, if you're here today, if you go home and determine to obey your parents, before you do that, please do this. Go and get a very large pillow and put it behind your mom so that when you start obeying, she's liable to faint and you don't want her to hit the ground. Let her hit a soft pillow. But you ought to determine that in your life. Why? Because God says so. God says it's better if you do that. So, you know what? We laugh as adults because we understand that because we've been through that. But can I tell you something? You have someone over you too. Are you submitting? Maybe you need to go get a pillow for your boss. Maybe you know get to go get a pill for somebody else that really you're not obeying what God says you should be obeying. So I know it's funny because we can relate to that as parents. If our kids obey us 30% of the time, we get very giddy. But they ought to obey us all the time. See, this is a sign of a believer. This is a sign of the martyrs. This is a sign of the persecuted church today. This must be the sign of you, you willing to follow God fully at all costs, even your physical life. In God's eyes, it is a beautiful mark upon us when by faith we fully follow God. In Jesus' day, many turned back when they found out what was at stake. They said, you know, we followed you this far. You fed the 5,000. I'm eating pretty good. But this whole other stuff about the cross and pick up your cross daily and follow me, yeah, I think that this is where I get off the train. I'll be a disciple from afar. <laughs> I'll just live stream. <laughs> I'll just read the sermon. And God says, no, you be part of it. Number three, to follow God holistically. 
Caleb did not want to choose the commands or question what directions God's word said to go, but he did whatever God's word said to do. He just, he just did it. Caleb's obedience was not a partial halting obedience, but a holistic, complete obedience. Today, Christianity among believers tends to look at their life as a large pie divided up into slices. Now, we went to the store yesterday, and I got a little, just one slice of pie, because I knew if I bought the whole pie, I'd eat the whole pie. And so I just got one slice, and, um, and it was good. I might go back and get another slice. But sometimes we look at our life like a slice of pie. Hmm, I'll give this to God. Oh, but I'm not going to give him this slice of my life. Oh, this is, this is mine. God, you can have these four slices of pie, but you can't have the other four. Because if I give you all that, then you have my whole life. And I want to have some of it. And so we pick and choose. And God says, it shouldn't be like that. It should be wholeheartedly. Everything is given over to the Lord because he knows what is best. That is what your life was given for. You can't, chicken, you can't pick and choose what to obey. You see, the majority in Caleb's decided to pick and choose what they would obey. We'll trust God when he's feeding us, but when things get a little lean, we're going to go back to Egypt. Egypt is always a picture of the world. So if you're not following God, you're living in the world. They had a Burger King philosophy. Anybody been to Burger King? Anybody been there? No? Just a few people? Been to Burger King? What's their philosophy? Have it your way. You can have it any way you want it. Have it your way. And that's not the philosophy of God. Have it your way. God bought you with a price. He died for you. He's alive. He loves you. He will defend you. He will give you purpose. He will give you joy. He will extend your influence to many being saved. We can't have a Burger King philosophy. I know they give you a crown. That's the problem. They give you a crown. I remember getting those paper crowns. My dad would bring them home from Burger King, and we wore them. But it didn't take very long to realize we weren't really the king of the house. But boy, we sure thought we were. Remember those? The younger kids are saying, what in the world are you talking about? Do they still have the crowns? They do. Oh my goodness. The result of this behavior is people are minimizing or making small the holistic demand of God to follow him totality their whole life. We tend to think of keeping what we want. Here's an example of keeping God's commandments. If, 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 if I have a saw and a hammer here, and I say to Richard, Richard, I have a saw and hammer here. How old are you, Richard? You're 14, so you're old enough to understand this. There's a saw and hammer here, and I, I, I tell you we're going to do some work today. And I say to Richard, Richard, now, when I give you the hammer, don't use the hammer to saw the boards. He'd say, Okay, and then I say, Richard, here's the saw. Don't use the saw to nail the nails into the board. He's laughing. He would say, well, uh, Pastor Coons, you know, I really am thankful you told me that, but duh. <laughs> who's going who's gonna to do that? That is so absolutely ridiculous. Nobody in their right mind would do something like that. I'm 14. Give me the power saw. I know what I'm doing. And so he says, you must be kidding me. That's ridiculous statements. But that's what believers do with their life. They use it for the wrong purpose that it was never intended to be used. They use the hammer as the saw, and the saw is the hammer. And when we pick and choose what we're going to do and how we're going to live and when we're going to live and what we're going to do if it fits our, if it fits our schedule, or we're going we're gonna to figure out all our problems instead of trusting you. Aren't we doing the same ridiculous thing that I was just telling Richard to do? It just doesn't make sense. And that's exactly what will happen. You will not fully live your life for the Lord. You cannot have joy of the Lord if you are living your life for a purpose God never intended. If you are not living what God intended your life to be now that you're saved, there's no joy. 
God intended to make you not a self-centered person, but a God-centered person to serve Him and to serve others. That's where the inner joy is. That's where the inner peace is. That's where the inner confidence is. That's where the inner direction that passeth all understanding is found. It's quite simple. You are fulfilling your person, your, your purpose on being on earth. It is a perfect fit. And Caleb experiences throughout his whole life, even in the wandering, because he had a wander, he was able to go over to the promised land. And our, our last number here is um, to follow God exclusively. That's found in Numbers 14, 24. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit within him, have followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land where into he went, and his seed shall possess it. There are two words used in the Old Testament for the word servant. The first one, and this is in Hebrew, I hope I'm saying it right, soccer means to be hired. It'd be like if you hired a maid, you hired a butler, you hired a lawn man. And in our text, the other word is, uh, is edbud, edbed, edbed. That one means no rights. Caleb considered himself to be a bondservant. God, whatever. I, I mean, there's no quitting, there's no going back. My whole life is your life. My, my willing slave, he does his time not as his own. His energy is the Lord's. His gifts are the Lord. He surrenders all to God. He's consecrated himself to God's will. If this were throughout the church, we'd be turning missionaries away. Could you imagine a missionary calling us and saying, hey, that's great. God's burned you to the mission field? Super. I'll tell you what, right now, we are already supplied overseas. We have so many missionaries that we can't really send any right now. Why don't you just come and serve here, and when one of them pass away or one of them gets too old, they can't go, then we'll send you. But right now, we really just, I'm sorry, we, just, we, don't, we, don't, we don't need any more pastors. We don't need any more school teachers. We don't, we don't need any more servants. I'll tell you what, we can't fit any more laborers in here. We have so many laborers, we're, we're, we're getting to too many doors. We're, we're seeing too many people saved. We've got to slow down. Could you imagine that? Now listen, I'm telling you right now, Eve plays first, and then the next 30 of you play the week after her. So you play twice a year. Oh, we have a nursery. Did you know that? It's hard to get one person in there. You would think we would have hundreds so that other people could be out of the nursery. Do you see what I'm saying? That's what we should be. That should be our heart, is that whatever talent God you've given me, I can't play the piano, but I can do this. I can't do this, but I can do this. And wherever, you're, where, wherever God has gifted you, give it wholeheartedly. That's what Caleb did. Caleb was nothing special. Caleb was not special at all. Caleb was just an ordinary man that just obeyed God. And last, the measure in the Massadists report. And that's found in Joshua 14.14. 14, if you'll turn there quickly, Joshua 14.14. 14. So it's a different book. So we're in the book of Joshua, so keep going forward towards the New Testament, to the book of Joshua. They finished their 40 years walking in the wilderness. They finished their 14 years. Hebron, therefore, 1414, Joshua 1414. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephani, the king. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, Kenzanite unto this day because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. After the 40 years, Caleb went over into the promised land. He's now 85 years old. So he's 85. I don't know if we have anybody in our congregation 85. I'm looking around here. I don't think anybody in here is 85. But you can imagine the challenges of being 85. But God says this about him. He says, most of the people around him had been negative his whole life. He had all that negative peer pressure. And after 40 years of battling uh, uh, with them, he's now 85, and God rewards him. Caleb was committed just not to a season, but his whole life, a lifeline commitment. No matter how old you are, it's not too late to give God everything and watch what he does with you. Caleb goes into the promised land with just his family, just his family, and he conquers the whole piece of land that God gave him. Now, there was millions before. They could have done it a lot easier, maybe, but God says it doesn't matter if two go or a million go. I'm still going to give you it. 
So whether someone goes with you or not, still go. Because God's going to give you the victory whether there's one or whether there's a million. And that's what God does here. Millions chose not to go. Caleb goes over with his family and they defeat all those uh, giants. God gives them the land. He, God says, Caleb says, give me the mountain. And God gave it to him. Him and his children. If you go on and you read all through Joshua, you'll just see victory after victory after victory. This is a powerful promise. He comes in the land. He's a victor. Caleb's and his sons go into the land and single-handedly, one family accomplishes what six million people said could not be done. Don't tell me we can't reach our community. Don't tell me there can't be a thriving local church on this corner. Because God says there can be. So there can be. This is amazing. God does the impossible through people who follow the Lord fully. That is what Caleb experienced, and many are experiencing that even today. Joshua chapter 15, verse 14. And Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, uh, Shisha, uh, Ahim, and Telamah, the children of Anak. He drove them out. The millions who decided not to follow God today live dead in the desert. That's where their corpuses are. What a wasted life. You really want to just give your life just wandering and never accomplishing anything for God? Three promises. God preserves Caleb's life. God gives him land. God gives him a godly heritage. Not only did he live for the Lord, but his children did too. I'd like to end with this illustration that I actually uh, received from um, Marie. We were talking and I called her the next day and said, I cannot get this off my mind. There was a, a period of time when um, Marie was younger with her family that they were in a log um, camp, uh, you know, where they would uh, cut down the logs and then her dad would drive them down to wherever they needed to go. And so they lived in that logging camp. And it was, um, it was, in, uh, it was in the northern California. And there was a man that had a burden for that group. And he says, you know, they really need to hear the gospel. And so him and his daughter would drive on those old roads, uh, probably not, not hours upon hours, but a couple hours. They'd drive over every Sunday after their service on those old mining roads, those old log roads, and they would come up and they would sit the children down. She was a child at the time. I forget, she said 10 years old or something. She was a child at the time, and him and his daughter, uh, one would take the adults, one would take the kids, I guess, and he was burdened so much that he just followed what God said, and he would just teach them the gospel, preach the gospel, and he would also uh, teach the little kids. Otherwise, they would not be in church, and that bothered him. Could you imagine being so concerned about those that weren't in church, and you couldn't get them to come to church, so you went to them? And this is what this man and this daughter did for years. And look at the impact they probably have had that we don't even know. Maybe people got saved. Marie told me this. She told me this right here. She said that uh, that's where she learned the song and heard it, Jesus Saves. And it made an impact on her life. That man got done with church, loaded up his daughter, drove two hours to make sure that probably not the most popular people, logging camp, went there and made sure that they heard the gospel every Sunday, making a difference, daring to be different, giving your life fully to God. I couldn't sleep after hearing that. I had to call her the next day and say, tell me more about that. You know, when I get to heaven, I'm going to see that man. And when I see him, you know what I'm going to say to him? I know you. Because I know Marie. And Marie's children don't know that man. But that man shaped her life somehow. And those other people too, that through their loins, those kids are maybe going on for the Lord. And maybe their children will go on for the Lord. All because one man fully followed God. Teenager, you can make a difference. Did you know that almost every major revival started with teenagers? Just a few that just decided to do right. And it so spread through the community that high schools were one. Just because.
Can I say to the adults here? Churches have reached their community because they believe that God was still alive and that his promises are still there. Let's get busy this spring. There are people 50 feet from this door, 100 yards from this door, that know not Christ. And we have the answer. There are people that would love to have a community that would love them like this, that would just take them the way they are, not judge them, just take them in. Say, come on, come on, you can come sit here for a while. Let us, let us put the, the balm of Gilead in your cut and let's, let's, let's get those wounds healed, those, those bitter wounds. Let's get them healed. And that's what God is rising up to be. Let's be Caleb's. So here's the invitation. You are standing, as the Israelites did on that day, at Kadesh Barnea. You are at a spiritual Kadesh Barnea. You'll either be what Solomon said, and that is where uh, they left church, well, synagogue, temple, and they just never changed. Good people, hardworking people, raised their family, not immoral, but they never grew spiritually. They never accomplished, because we know that, because Solomon says that, and we see that they rejected the Messiah. They rejected going into the promised land. We see that. What will our church do? Our church is made up of individuals, so it's your choice. Will you fully follow God? No matter what your age is, God's not done. If you're breathing, God's not done. Young person, you have your whole life. You have, we, we only have half of our life left, if that much. You have a full life. Give it fully to God. What decision do you need to make? What decision do you need to make? Miss Eve's going to come and she's going to play on the piano. Piano's not to stir your emotional part of your being, though music does. This is really for you just to think. What will you do with the message today? Will you be like the Jews? And the majority of them said, we'll take the desert. Or you'll be like Caleb, Joshua, and say, we'll take the promised land. Which one will you do? What decision will you make? That's what our theme is all about this year, growing in grace. What will you do? You can close your eyes. You can keep your eyes open. You can come forward. You can do whatever you think you need to do. But do something. You will today. You'll either reject it or you'll take it. There's no, there's no in between. What will you do, young person? What will you do, old person? <laughs> what will you do? Play, sister. going to play through one more time. Just enjoy this. Before you know, you're going to be in the rat race in five minutes. Life is going to be hitting you. There's lunch. There's things on your docket today that's got to get done. Enjoy this time because sometimes you just don't have this time. Enjoy. Enjoy the thoughts on God. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for Caleb. What a life. And we only scratched the surface of his life. We don't know what happened during those 40 years of wandering. We don't understand it all, but we, we know this much is that he chose to uh, follow you. And Father, may we, teenagers, adults, doesn't matter our age, will we fully follow God. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Right before we close, I want to tell you that, you know, sometimes you say something and the Holy Spirit smotes your heart. And this whole message, I've been really troubled in my spirit because I said something that I, I think I better clear up. 
And, um, and that is, I, I said about the live streamers, I'm talking about those that can come to church that choose not to come to church. And the Lord smote me right away. He said, that might be taken the wrong way. I'm thankful for the Spirit. I am human. And uh, that comment was, 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 was wrong and it was insensitive. I am not saying that. I'm saying that those that, that, that choose to watch a preacher out in California from Chicago and they never dorn the, 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 the local church to go out and make a difference. That's what I'm talking about there. I know our people on live stream, they'll come when it's ready. And they'll come and they can come here anytime that they're ready. That's fine. I understand that. But, but I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about ones that, that can come to church. And it's been that way for years now uh, where the electronic church has become their pastor. But that pastor can't visit them. You, you need a pastor that can come to your house. You need a pastor that you know and can touch and can feel and know. And that's, that's what I'm talking about there. So just to make sure that that is clear um, on that. Um, sometimes, you know, you just say things that you shouldn't say, and I did. And I apologize for that. Father, thank you now for today. and Give us a good day. Give us a good time of fellowship. Give us a good time of sweetness together. Uh, Lord, keep our church in unity. Uh, we can get out of unity very quickly and we can't be that way. Help us to be spirit-filled and spirit-controlled. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.